Well, God bless you, Calvary family. May God continue to bless you. I pray and trust your year is off to a, just a great start. And I hope that uh, yeah, so far in the, this young year, you are continually seeking the Lord, getting close to him, getting into his word, and letting the Holy Spirit empower you. Today, I want to talk to you about waiting for God's promises. You know, one of the hardest things about having faith is not just believing when you can't see. From a theological standpoint, theological speaking, theologically speaking, it's, it's believing when we can't see. But practically speaking, perhaps the hardest thing for believers is to wait. And you know, God has made promises to us in his word, and oftentimes there's a gap between the time of the promise and the time of fulfillment. And that means that we have to have faith while we wait. I want to talk to you today about waiting for God's promises. And it's based on the story of a woman who waited for years for God's promise to be fulfilled. And it's her faith. We see it's a story of how her faith was tested, but also rewarded, and how her life offers for us today a good example of how to have faith when you wait. Let's pray. We thank you, God, for this time that we'll spend in your word. I pray you would use today's message to strengthen our faith to fortify our faith, and to edify us spiritually. Help us, Lord, to learn how to have faith even when we are in your waiting room waiting for your promise to be fulfilled. And I pray for all who are watching now, whatever their needs may be, whatever prayers and cares they have before you, that you would provide, that you would meet their needs and strengthen their faith in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've read the Bible, you know that there are many stories about women who wanted to have children but could not. And I could make a long list and you would remember all their stories, but perhaps the best known story about such a person is a story of a woman named Sarai. Her story is told in the book of Genesis and mentioned also in the book of Hebrews. And here's what the writer of Hebrews has to say about Abraham's wife. And this comes from Hebrews 11, verses 11 and 12. It says, by faith, Sarai herself, also received strength to conceive seed and that she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as a sand, which is by the seashore. Now, like so many others who were mentioned in the 11th chapter of Hebrews, which is commonly known as the Hall of Faith, some may wonder how in the world Sarah ever got into this list, into this hall of faith. I mean, her life is checkered with failure and discouragement. One author described her as the wife of the great patriarch. And we tend to think of her with a high degree of dignity. Uh, when you read the biblical account of her life, however, it is impossible not to notice that sometimes she behaved very badly. I mean, she could throw fits and tantrums. She knew how to manipulate and she was even known to get mean. She would be impatient. Temperamental, conniving, cantankerous, cruel, pouty, jealous, erratic, unreasonable, a whiner, and a complainer. In fact, there are hints in the Bible that Sarah may have been something of a pampered beauty. The name given to her when she was born, Sarai, literally means my princess. And scripture remarks repeatedly how stunningly attractive this woman was. Wherever she went, she instantly received favor and privilege because of her good looks. And that kind of thing could spoil the best of women. And by the way, the Bible account of Sarah's life doesn't even begin until she was already 65 years old. And amazingly, even at her age, at that age, her physical beauty was so remarkable that Abraham regularly assumed that other powerful men wanted his wife. And on a couple of occasions, he compromised his own integrity out of fear that they would come and get his wife and he would be killed. So in order to understand the reference to Sarah in the book of Hebrews, let me just give you a review of Sarah's life. And let's begin with the failure of her faith. Sarah's impatience. Sarah's impatience is the first thing we know from Genesis 16. Listen to these words from verses one through four in that chapter. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abraham, see now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid and perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abraham heeded the voice of Sarai and Sarai, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave to her a, 
husband Abraham to be his wife after Abram dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan. So Abram went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Now, Sarah was 65 and Abraham was 75 when God told them that he was going to make a great nation out of them. And if you go back to the 12th chapter in Genesis, you'll hear that promise that God makes to them that out of Abraham and Sarah will come a multitude of people and a great nation will be born of them. And after God made that promise, 10 years went by and there was still no son. And Abraham is now 85, Sarah is 75. And so Abraham finally agrees to this sordid plan that Sarah come, comes up with involving her servant, Hagar. And at the age of 86, Abraham becomes the father of Ishmael. Now, Genesis 16 says, so Hagar bore Abraham a son and Abram named his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. And after the birth of Ishmael, 13 years go by and you don't read anything about Abram and Sarah. The story just kind of goes dormant. And Ishmael was born 11 years after God's promise. And as we look forward, we discover later on that Isaac is born 24 years after God's original promise. And you see one writer makes the following observation of the thing that shouts loudest here in the story of Abraham and Sarah is that there's not an honorable character in the whole cast. They were all ignoble. Abraham was the worst. He was pathetic, passive, impotent, uncaring about either his wife or Hagar. Neither woman had any compassion on the other. Sarah was worse, but you get the idea that if Hagar had the chance, she'd been just as bad, end quote. That's the observation of one writer after having read through this story. Now, friends, remember, all of this chaos began when people of faith began to distrust the word of God. It took shape when they decided that God needed help in fulfilling his promise. And it took off when Abraham and Sarah took a shortcut to obtain what they knew God promised to give them. And all we, and we all sit here and we smile about the historical event, but we know how hard it is for us to wait. In fact, nobody likes to wait. But if you think about it, we are all constantly waiting. You have to wait in line when you go to the grocery store. You have to wait in line when you go see a doctor. We call it the waiting room. You have to wait in line when you go to the gas station. You have to wait in line when you go to the bank. And most importantly, you have to wait in line when you go to a restaurant. You wait in line first to get in. Then you wait in line to get a seat. Then you wait in line to get a menu. Then you, get a, you wait for the server to come get your order. Then you wait for your food to come. Then you wait for the dessert menu. Then you wait for that uh, order to come. And then you wait for the bill. And then you wait for the server to come bring you the change or your receipt. And then... They had the gall to call the person who presides over all of this, the waiter, when in reality, you are the one who's waiting. Now, Sarah didn't want to wait. She was impatient. And how do we know that? She took things in her own hands. Notice, secondly, not only her impatience, but his, her insubordination. Genesis 16, 5 says, Then Sarah, I say to Abram, my wrong be upon you. I gave my maid into your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between you and me. You see, Sarah blamed, Sarah blamed everything on her husband. And somehow, even though she had come up with this plan, she found a way to put the blame on him. I mean, it's really hard to find any logic in her words. Somebody had to be blamed, so she pointed her finger at her husband. Now, of course, you can't let Abram off the hook either, because after all, he was a patriarch. He was the head of the household. God had spoken to him, and all he had to do was say, hey, Sarah... That's not a good idea. Let's keep on trusting and waiting on the Lord. But he didn't. He should have never allowed that situation. We see her impatience. We see her insubordination, her intolerance, and her infidelity. And Abraham went along with it. But let's notice now in Genesis chapter 17. Abraham is now 99 years young. And Sarah was 89. And the Lord again spoke to Abram and reaffirmed that he was going to give him a son. And this time he made it very clear that this son would be, was going to be born to his wife, Sarah, not no surrogate mother. Genesis 17, 1 and 15 through 19 says this, when Abraham was 99 years old, then God said to Abraham, as for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarah, but you shall call her name Sarah. And I will bless her and also give you a son by her. Then I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be from her. And Abraham fell on his face and he laughed. 
And he said in his heart, shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. You see, even Abraham, who's considered the father of faith, even he struggled with this because of that long gap between the time that the promise was, was announced and the promise was fulfilled. And here we find the Lord reinforcing what he had told Abraham many years before. And Abraham was struggling to accept it. In other words, Lord, this ain't going to happen. Let Ishmael be, uh, be the, the son. Uh, you can claim Ishmael as the answer to your promise. And I'll be all right with that. He said, Lord, let Ishmael stand. And God said, no, Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son. And you shall call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. And a little bit later, according to the story, Abraham was outside and the Bible says he was under the tree and the Lord appeared to him. And this is where we see the Lord uh, reinforcing constantly in, in response to Abraham's disbelief. In Genesis 18, he says, Abraham, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life and behold, Sarah, your wife will have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent door, which was behind him. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself. Now, first we read about Abraham laughing, and now we find Sarah laughing. And after I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Saying, shall I surely bear a child since I am old? Is anything too hard with the Lord? At the appointed time, I will come and return to you according to the time of life and Sarah will have a son. But Sarah denied it. But Sarah denied it saying, I didn't laugh for she was afraid. And he said, no, but you did laugh. Now imagine this just for a moment. Abram is, Abraham is outdoors and he comes in and Sarah says to him, Abraham, where have you been? And he says, well, I've been outside having my morning devotion. And Sarah said, how was it? And Abraham says, it was great. In fact, I had this conversation with God and he told me something really amazing. She said, what was it? And he blurted out only a man, as a man could, baby, you're going to have a baby. And I'd like, I, I, I'd like um, to have heard what Sarah said to that because on a scale of one, one to 10, Sarah's faith at that moment would be about a zero. But here she is with all of her failures and she's enshrined in the hall of faith. Now, what a picture of God's grace and patience that is. God is greater than our sin. He is greater than our doubts. And isn't it a good thing? 2 Timothy 2.13 says, when we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Paul said in Romans 3.3, for what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make them faithful, uh, make the faithfulness of God without effect? And then in 1 Thessalonians 5.24 says, he who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. He's, he's faithful no matter what because it is impossible for him to be anything other than faithful. And even though Sarah and Abraham were wavered on occasion early on in their faith, they came to a settled conclusion that God was true, that his promise was reliable, and then God continued to be faithful to them even when they did not act out of faithfulness to him. So as you can see, Sarah's kind of an interesting candidate for the Hall of Faith. But let's take another look at this now. Let's look at the fulfillment of Sarah's faith. We looked at the failure. Let's now look at the fulfillment. Because in light of the stories we just read, how surprised we are when we come to the New Testament and read these words from Hebrews 11, 11 and 12. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. And she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. She judged who faithful? God. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead, referring to Abraham, in other words, he was so advanced in age, were born as many as the stars of the sky and multitude, innumerable as a sand which is by the seashore. Three times in that verse, we are reminded three times in Genesis 21, 1 to 2, we were reminded that what happened to Sarah was because of the word of God, because of what God had said. The Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah received and bore Abraham a son in his old age, and at the set time of which God had spoken to him. The scene took place when Isaac was born. 
must have been pure joy. What a wonderful picture and glorious thought. Here is God's promise finally being fulfilled after all these years of waiting. And when the child was born, they called him Isaac. And by the way, do you know what the name Isaac means? Isaac literally means laughter. And that's what the word means. It's kind of an interesting word, isn't it? For a hundred year old father and a 90 year old mother, they have a baby and call him laughter. Wow. And and, and so you look at Sarah and her faith and you see um, that it conquered the possibility. That's why Hebrews 11 says, and by faith, even Sarah, who is past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and as good as as dead as he was, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. Impossible, but not with God. For Luke says, things which are impossible to men are possible with God. He's God. I mean, he created Abraham and Sarah in the first place. Sarah's faith conquered improbability. Romans 4 tells us, and not being weak in faith, Abraham did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through the unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Friends, let, 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 me, let me summarize this for you. For 25 years, for 25 years, Abraham and Sarah, in spite of their moment of failure, believed God. And they had no evidence at all to prove it was going to happen. Their faith was sustained and they did not become weak in faith so that they gave up on what God had promised. Sarah had her moments, as we all have learned, and we all have our moments. But every time she had a birthday and she realized she was one year older, the more impossible this promise seemed to her. But Hebrews 11, 11 says, by faith, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and she bore a child. She conquered impossibility. She conquered improbability and she conquered inadequacy. Do you know that from, from, from the time that we are introduced to Sarah in the Bible, almost every time that she's mentioned, the whole issue of her not having any babies is in the story. In fact, she is mentioned the first time in Genesis eleven twenty nine. And in and, and, and verse 30, but Sarah was barren and she had no child. Now we see her on the other side of God's promise. And not only is she the mother of Isaac, but through Isaac, she's the mother of all who believe and the ultimate generation from which our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ came. Sarah's faith conquered inconsistency. We've already learned that. We've learned about wavering. How many of you understand what it means to waver in your faith? Got any answers? Got any waverers out there? I mean, you've wavered. Why have wavered? We've all wavered. And I know what God has said. I believe that what God has said, but sometimes if you're not careful, how many of you know wavering often comes as a byproduct of fatigue? Now, you know, somebody said, your body and your soul live so close together that they catch each other's diseases. And it's true. When you're fatigued, when you're tired, sometimes it's hard to believe God. Sometimes our faith wavers. But the Bible says that Sarah and Abraham let their faith stay strong. And Sarah's faith conquered her infidelity. And once again, it's interesting when you put the Hebrews passages together with the Romans passage, you see Abraham and Sarah together. Romans 4.21 tells us Abraham fully convinced that what God had promised, he was able to perform. Hebrews 11.11 says Sarah judged him faithful as he had promised. You know, it's been said, and I believe this to be true, that next to suffering, we learn more as Christians about walking with God through waiting than through any other thing. Isn't it true? When God gives us a promise and we have to wait and we have to struggle with our own humanity and our own frailty and we're believing God, we know that God has promised, but we haven't yet seen it. We grow in our faith. We learn to trust God. We learn you can see Jesus in the dark. Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher from Britain, once said, I have thumbed through my Bible many times every year. I've never yet thumbed through a broken promise because God never breaks his promises. You can trust and you can rely on what God has said because every promise God has ever made and will ever make will always come true. So what we learn from the story of Sarah is that we live many of our days as Christians in a time of waiting for the promise to be. The Bible says this in John 14, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. Friends, that's a promise, but that promise was made a long time ago. 
many, many more years than 24 years ago, and still it hasn't come. But I believe that it will come, and in my moments when I may waver myself, I am strengthened in my faith as I read the Word of God and I read the promises of God, and I remember that in all the record of God's doings with His creatures, He has never broken any promises. And He's not about to let you be the first one. Someday the sky will break open, Jesus will return, and those who have put their trust in Him will be caught up together to be with him in the air. And the Bible puts it this way in 1 Thessalonians 4, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. You say, how do you believe the promise that Jesus is coming back? How do you really believe it? You commit yourself to it, and you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. And that's how you become a Christian, a follower of Jesus. Don't tell me you believe if you haven't accepted it. You might believe that it's true, But if you don't believe it personally for yourself, you really don't believe. Belief is just head knowledge about some truth. Belief is a commitment to that truth for your life, betting your eternity on the fact that it's true. And if you've never done that, what a great time to say, you know, I finally got this figured out. I believe what God has promised. I believe what he did on the cross through his son, Jesus Christ. And I believe for me now is a time to put my faith in him. And friend, I want to end today's message by giving you, if you haven't placed your faith in Christ yet, if you haven't received the gift of salvation through his son, Jesus Christ, I invite you to receive Jesus in your heart right now. Because what the Bible tells us about why Jesus came, just like every other promise God has made, including the promise of sending his son, Jesus Christ, that promise came true. And the next promise that he will return for his followers, for his children, is also true. And if you believe, you will accept Jesus in your heart. I invite you to receive Jesus in your heart as Lord and Savior. Pray this prayer with me. Mean it in your heart. Dear God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to this earth to die on the cross for my sins. He paid a debt I could never pay on my own. And God, the promise of his return following his resurrection is as good as every other promise you have made because it will always come true. And so, Lord, I receive Jesus in my heart as Lord and Savior of my life. I turn away from my sins and I commit to follow in Jesus' way. Help me now, strengthen my faith and help me now to wait in a faithful way. In Jesus' name, amen. Friend, if you pray this prayer, I want to congratulate you. I want to encourage you to keep seeking the Lord, keep getting into his word, and I encourage you to keep visiting us, either virtually or in person, because now it's about growing your faith. It's about heeding God's instruction and understanding uh, what God wants you to do for him now. But for the rest of us, remember this, we're all in God's waiting room. And just like Sarah and Abraham's life teaches us, Faith grows and develops and matures when we're waiting. Keep waiting, but keep trusting. Keep having faith. And you'll see that in his time, he will make all things beautiful because the fulfillment of God's promise is just a wait away. May God continue to bless you and give you the strength to wait.